everyone loves a good villain, especially a good Disney villain. But unfortunately, they feel a bit harder to come by these days. A few years ago, a lot of Disney and Pixar movies fell into the trend of having twist villains that weren't really that great of a twist. And recent films like Ralph Breaks the Internet, Onward, and Soul don't really have an antagonist. I'm not saying that villains are being phased out entirely, but I find that conflicts and entertainment are leaning more and more into moral ambiguity. Not just in film, but all across the board. Movies, television, video games, no matter where you look, more and more stories are pivoting in this direction. And I suppose it makes sense. The media we consume sticks with us. I suppose the presence of a clear-cut villain likely leads to the impression that a lot of conflicts in the real world are black and white. It's human nature to view ourselves as the main character to a certain degree. Thus, consuming stories where the main character is constantly presented as a clear-cut good guy, triumphing over whoever they're in conflict with, said foe typically presented as an objective evil, it may lead to people not having the healthiest assessment of a real-world situation. Even when the good guy is chock full of flaws and the villain shows traces of humanity, if anything, it may just reinforce the idea that whoever we oppose is in the wrong, with minimal room for nuance. In actuality, there needs to be a balance. It should be made clear that yes, not every situation is black and white. But at the same time, viewers need to be reminded that there is still evil out in the world. That some people will get a second chance, third chance, fourth chance, fifth chance, and so on, misusing those opportunities every single time. And while Disney and Pixar's films may be lacking in the villain department recently, there is absolutely no shortage in the television department. In recent years, we've had villains like Bill Cipher, Varian, Cassandra, Toffee. I'm not caught up with DuckTales, but I know they have a few villains. Yeah, yeah, that one right there on screen. Yeah, I, I, I know their name. And recent installments have brought us Grimes, Sasha, King Andreas, Emperor Bellos. That one villain from the Owl House with a funny name. Is it Tibbles? I, I think it's Tibbles. Tiblet, Tibbly, Grinhammer the Third! An array of villains that can range from clear-cut evil too complex and misguided. All of them have their own motivations that arguably make sense. At the very least, the audience is able to comprehend why the antagonist feels that way, even when we still disagree with them. And I love that these villains are larger than life, because despite all their quirks and dark backstories that make them who they are, they are still representative of ideologies, actions, and fates to avoid. But today, I don't want to talk about those larger than life villains. They can wait. I want to talk about the kind of villain that we know exists in the real world. The kind of person who has the power and resources to make a big difference in the community around them and help out the little guy, but instead uses those resources to oppress and control others. The kind of person who, when they feel humiliated, will resort to any means necessary in an attempt to ruin someone's life. The kind of person who started out as a normal human being, just like me and you, but succumbed to the root of all evil, money. This is the story of Chip Whistler, otherwise known as the main antagonist of Big City Greens on Disney Channel. A show that people have been asking me to talk about for a while, one that I've been wanting to talk about for a while. I just needed time for the perfect topic. Now that the series has shaken things up with the status quo altering half hour special, Chipocalypse Now, I want to take a look at Chip's art throughout the series thus far. His introduction, his spiral from a rival to full on arch enemy, his comeuppance, and what direction his character could be heading towards in the future. I want to talk about why the show nails Chip's character as the kind of capitalistic, arrogant villain that we see in the real world. Not only why he works as a villain, but why he's your new favorite Disney villain. Maybe he will be anyways, I don't know. And before we dive in, I just want to remind you guys to please like and subscribe, it helps out a lot. Obviously if you're new here, wait until the video is over to figure out if you even like it. <laughs> But for a lot of regular viewers, I know you come from the recommended more than the subscription feed thanks to the current state of YouTube, but subscribing does go a long way and will help you stay on top of all of our uploads. So who's this Chip Whistler guy anyway? Okay, looking at him on the surface, he seems like the generic CEO villain. Someone who's all about the money. And I would actually argue there's more going on than that. In nearly every major appearance, we learn something new about Chip that helps unravel the many layers to him. Not only that, Chip is not necessarily driven by money, even if that is what ultimately corrupted him. 
He's driven by pride and approval. So much to the point that it's self-sabotaging behavior. Over the course of Big City Greens, Chip has ample opportunity to not only become Mr. Moneybags, but obtain everything he believes the Green family is preventing him from gaining. We currently have only so much of the shattered memories that piece together Chip's origin. From what we can gather, he actually seems to have contributed a good amount of effort for him and his father to launch Wholesome Foods. As a conversation with his father in the episode Reckoning Ball revealed, Chip was once a hard-working farmer, who from this photograph alone seemed humble and in love with his job, which is wild. Because by his introduction into the series alone, you would assume he was an unfortunate product of nepotism. Seriously, his entrance immediately says it all. He snaps at Bill buddy, for attention. God, he assumes the Green family is putting on a humble but quirky farmer act in order to farm sympathy sales. Chib not only judges Bill when he realizes he's missing a finger, but he wipes down his hands immediately. He doesn't even give him a genuine handshake. This guy sucks! Chip's first order of business is, well, conducting business with the Green family, trying to get their crops sold in wholesome foods. And isn't that just lovely? He oh, hates the poor, urchin. but wants to exploit small businesses, selling their produce at an insane markup. Obviously, the Greens would also benefit from this. They'd make some cash having their vegetables be in stores. But Chip is ensuring there's ultimately a profit for the company above anything else. Which in itself is just business. It's just appalling because he treats them like garbage right off the bat. And this is where our lead character Cricket has to learn his first lesson about Chip. Cricket, wanting the best for his family, goes against his father's humble nature by faking crops. Something that we learn would very much be a Chip Whistler move, and is actually paralleled later on in the series. They were practically destined to become rivals. Similar approaches, different intents. Chip doesn't really cease his assumptions of Bill's character in this episode, referring to the customers as rubes, much like Cricket does earlier in this episode. Ultimately, Cricket realizes that unlike Chip, he has to be an honest man. He can't cheat the system. And while attempting to recover all of the fake produce, Cricket is too late to prevent Chip from biting into a fake apple, causing Chip to, well, chip his tooth, a lesson for his greed, and the catalyst for their rivalry. Chip's cracked teeth is important in more ways than one. As an entrepreneur, appearances are everything to him. We already saw the judgments he passed on the Green family at the start of this episode. He wants people to look at him and view the embodiment of success. But how's he gonna do that if his front tooth's all jacked up? Furthermore, this serves as a consequence for Chip, and this is something that makes his character interesting. Big City Greens is a show that values its continuity, even if it is episodic. There's a moving story in each and every Chip appearance, and surprise, surprise, they all end with damage to his teeth. This gag works not just because it's funny and satisfying, but it ensures that Chip always faces consequences. Yet, he never calls it quits. He never backs off. Instead, as we'll discuss, he brainstorms and finds sneakier ways to carry out his misdeeds. Chip's next appearance, Feud Fight, explores his lack of self-awareness and makes you question why he views himself as the hero when he clearly is in the wrong. An average day at the farmer's market for the Green family spirals into a turf war between Cricket and Chip, as Chip sets up a wholesome foods booth. As Cricket puts it, the farmer's market is for the little guy. So why is a well-established, profitable company setting up shop? Well, for money, of course. And honestly, this episode's social commentary on capitalism gets a little too real. Chip utilizes his money and brand influence to draw attention away from the Green family, busting out partnerships and coupons, using his acts as a greater resources to outshine the competition. We see this happen all the time. Just look at independently owned online shops that have to compete with the likes of Amazon. It's harder and harder to escape the big name brands. And unless said brand does something to make an ass out of themselves, it is harder to convince consumers to support the little guy. Luckily for the Green family, Chip does make an ass out of himself. Cricket's attempts to sabotage Chip do not go unnoticed. But again, Chip lacks self-awareness. And we already established that he really values his reputation. Cricket is a child. Chip is a full-blown adult. Chip should not stoop to Cricket's level. 
but he does, despite Cricket's attempt at making amends. Chip assaulting Cricket with a barrage of tomatoes, which plenty of people see and capture on video. Yo! And his fixed tooth gets chipped once again, thanks to thoughtlessly consuming a very hot pepper. Coffee Quest marks the point where Chip resorts to unhinged, childish tactics in order to further wholesome food profits and exact revenge on Cricket at the same time. Cricket and Gloria face off against Chip when there's a shortage of coffee in Big City, Chip stooping to desperate measures in order to steal their bag of coffee beans. Now, Chip is more of a background presence in this episode as it focuses more on Gloria, yet everything ties back together in the end, an ending that starts to lean into a huge tactic of Chip's, manipulating emotions. Chip arguing to Gloria that city folks should stick together and strikes an offer for her to work at Wholesome Foods. This could be Gloria's chance at a higher paying job that could lead into a higher quality of living, which in return would impress her parents. But seeing as Gloria isn't from Big City, alongside growing fond of the Green family, decides to stay true to herself and delivers the finishing blow to Chip's tooth and ego. God, we should really do a Gloria video next. The show has recently made her a main addition to the cast, an upgrade from her recurring role, and I just love all of the insight and assumably real-life experiences that they are pouring into her character. I feel like we haven't had a character like this that gives insight into being an adult in their 20s since maybe Frankie Foster. If there's been any beforehand but I either just don't remember or haven't seen the show, please let me know in the comments. Now, remember when I said Chip is a character that repeatedly faces consequences but never really truly learns from them, never grows from them, and instead doubles down. Well, this is where the episode Reckoning Ball really spices things up. Chip assaulting Cricket with tomatoes went viral, ruining business at Wholesome Foods. And this is where we're properly introduced to Chip's father, the current CEO of Wholesome Foods. Chip's father is disappointed, not just because his son assaulted a child with tomatoes, but for what that incident means. Chip lost his way, and furthermore, money corrupts. This is where we learn that he used to be a humble farmer, much like the Green family. And what I said about Chip's lack of self-awareness really shines through in this moment. Because Chip is money motivated, you would assume the entire company would be, right? His dad wouldn't be any different, but he is. Mr. Whistler wants wholesome foods to aid the farmer's market, not oppress them. And he wants his son to take over as CEO for Wholesome Foods, yet because of his behavior, instead he feels compelled to fire Chip. And of course the boy immediately breaks down and behaves like a child, crying and begging his father to avoid firing him, which to me shows how detached he's become from reality. I don't believe Chip was just disregarding his father's wishes the entire time. I do believe he wanted to impress his father, but do so by bringing in money. Yet it feels like he's become so disillusioned, so reliant on his wealth, that he felt his upper class status put him above human decency. That people really wouldn't care about what he does because he's Chip Whistler. Of course his father wants to see the good in Chip, but instead of letting him off the hook, he makes Chip face the magic C word of his actions, consequences. Case in point, Chip has to earn his job back by having the Green sign a forgiveness contract, something that is evidently really important to Mr. Whistler. And it not only shows just how different these two are, but it also shows that money won't corrupt you if your head is in the right place and if your motivations are well intended. I love that this single action alone distinguishes Chip's father from his son. Throughout this episode, Chip is reluctant to put in sincere effort into making amends with the Greens, and his struggle to perform farm work serves as another example of how Chip has lost his way. He went from a natural to passing out in the Greens' garden. We also see a more emotional side to Chip, as he openly expresses his conflicted views towards the Greens and the importance of his father's approval. Chip shows vulnerability to the Green family, this episode is a big turning point for Chip. Unfortunately, for the worst. Chip's big speech to the Green family is all it takes for Cricket to sign the forgiveness contract. They just wanted honesty. And once Chip is officially CEO, his father heading towards retirement, he reveals his true colors. His conversation with the Greens was another manipulation tactic. And now that he's in charge, he ensures that he'll finally run them out of town. Now, despite this, I don't think everything Chip said was a load of baloney. I think to an extent, everything Chip said about his feelings towards the Green family was true. He was just leaving out some details, like how his disdain for them definitely outweighs any other conflicted feelings. Oh my God, he hates them. But also, I think everything he said about his father and how he longed for his father's approval, how much his father means to him, was the actual truth. 
but for reasons unknown, something about Chip is encouraging him to block out his conscience, to block out the good, honest farmer that his dad still sees in him. Evident by Chip hiding his father's framed photograph of Chip as a toddler. There's a part of Chip that recognizes what he's doing is wrong, but instead of correcting his behavior, he's just choosing to ignore any sign or reminder. Unfortunately for Chip, this self-sabotaging behavior leads to a bigger downward spiral. Remember Chip operating off assumptions and rolling with it? Well, that returns in the episode FriendCon! Despite no reason for conflict between the parties, and Chip only being wronged by Cricket in the past, we can infer that the whole forgiveness contract thing and doing labor for the Greens has caused Chip's resentments to be unfairly projected onto the entire family. Something that happens in real life far too often. When Cricket and Tilly want to find a new companion for Bill at a farmer's convention, Tilly decides this is the best chance to prove Chip's redemption, pairing the two up. In the, uh, non-shipping way, please. Chip sees his dad and Bill, we, we just can't make that weird. Of course, Bill is just another pawn in Chip's game, as Whistler wants to sabotage Bill's big farm con speech. And he nearly achieves it, hindering Bill's ability to speak and going as far as to impersonate him. All of this blindsiding Bill in the process. He never did anything wrong, so why is he being punished? But of course Chip is got by his own Achilles heel, leading to him being publicly humiliated and Chip loses all but one tooth. Again, Chip thrives off of respect and is someone who greatly values appearances. So this last tooth is the last straw, and he finally puts his foot down in the episode Chipwrecked. Chip is up to some shit, man. He's got a whole ass grill, and his obsession with destroying the greens has catapulted to the unhealthiest degree. He's neglecting his duties as CEO. We learn of multiple never-before-seen attempts to pull one over the greens, all of which has left him defeated and in a declining physical and emotional state. Chip's latest scheme is competing with Cricket's indebted gig at Big Coffee, with a Wholesome Foods coffee truck of his own, blasting rounds of coffee into caffeine-craving customers. Try saying that three times fast. Caffeine-craving customers, caffeine-craving customers, caffeine-craving customers, I did it! But the police end up towing him for parking next to a fire hydrant. Wow, I guess the police do do good sometimes. Here come the comments acting like most cartoons have ever treated cops with respect. Although Chip may have had an insincere apology to the Greens, his vulnerability in relation to his father was real, as he has a meaningful pep talk from his concerned father. A conversation that leaves out the details of him terrorizing a little kid. And I love that this conversation actually parallels Cricket's B-plot in this episode. And yes, the Greens actually are the B-plot in this episode. It is very much a Chip A plot. But anyways, Cricket deceives his family into doing his job for him, trying to make it seem like they're participating in a just cause, but they eventually catch on. Cricket learning that tricking your family only works for so long, so either enjoy it while it lasts or just be honest to your family. A lesson Chip will have to learn the hard way, as his dad encourages him to act like a CEO, that Chip has the resources to succeed. But unfortunately, they have two very different definitions of what a CEO is, as this is where Chip truly acts like the kind of villain you see in real life. Finally growing a spine, he fires his assistants, asserts his place as CEO at Wholesome Food, and the biggest flex of all, he buys Big Coffee, firing all of its staff, including Cricket and Gloria, in order to build a new Wholesome Foods. One that he implies may need a little expansion. A clear warning to the Green family, he's coming for their home. And this takes us to Chippocalypse now, and my oh my do I love this episode. Everything from before in Chip's arc is paid off here. All the details, all the foiled schemes, and more importantly, Chip's perception of the situation. It brings us to this very moment. Everything Chip thinks Cricket has wrought onto him, he wants to fire right back at him tenfold. As the family is in the midst of panic, they learn that Chip has not only bought Big Coffee, but the apartment complex right next to the Green household as well forcing their neighbors out. And considering season one had an episode of Tilly bonding with a neighbor's cat, Anoush, ouch, I got upset seeing them leave. Remember how Chip thought Cricket was turning Big City against him in Feud Fight? You know how Chip actually embarrassed himself in FriendCon? Well, he wants to return the favor. Not only plotting to turn the Green household into a parking lot, but is granted authorization by manipulating the court of public opinion fabricating a petition of fake signatures. Chip wants the Green family to feel as hated by everyone as he believes Cricket has made him feel hated by everyone. Chip wants to take everything from them, everything from Cricket,
like it. His job, his friends, and soon, his home. Thankfully, after some shenanigans and Nancy letting herself back in jail, but is freed shortly after thanks to weird reasoning from Officer Keys. I don't want your family to leave. You're my favorite people to police. They have evidence to present to the mayor that Chip's petition is indeed fake. All of the signatures stem from the same IP address, which not only was I happy to see this looting in the show, but I'm glad to see it in a Disney cartoon. It's very easy to spread misinformation, and while this is more of an ungrounded situation, it's still important for these things to be consumed by an all-ages audience, so they're encouraged to not only give the benefit of the doubt, but just as important, it encourages them to do their own research. We have a big Act 3 showdown in the Green's front yard, which is fitting, given the events of Reckoning Ball, which is an interesting title in retrospect, considering here, Chip is moments away from demolishing the Green household. The showdown ends up being broadcast on local news, leading to the people a big city to stand up for the Greens in person, affirming to the mayor that they do like the Greens. The court of public opinion back in the Greens' favor, although it never really left, and once again outcasting Chip, who is not having this. This man pulls up with the choppa, and once he realizes everything is imploding on him, Chip straight up tries to murder the Green family with the helicopter, his ego and impulses once again getting the better of him, as Cricket tricks Chip into his own defeat, once again damaging his teeth in the process. Chip gets literally sent flying, the Greens get to keep their home, the new wholesome foods is removed, and I'm curious to see what's gonna replace it because the credits have been teasing something. No big coffee or wholesome foods, it's a whole new ballpark, and now that Gloria has has no job because of Cricket, again, she moves in by force. To little objection from the Greens, of course. And that's the story of Chip Whistler thus far. For a show like Big City Greens, I didn't expect to get this invested into the antagonist. But not only is he perfect for the show, again, he's the kind of villain you see in real life. Someone who's motivated by his own greed, his need to be loved by everyone. And again, because of his privilege, he doesn't really grow from his consequences. If he's loaded and holds this level of power, he probably feels like he doesn't need to change. That if he keeps throwing enough money and schemes at the wall, eventually he'll come out on top. But after Chipocalypse Now, obviously that's gonna be harder for him. So, what's next for Chip Whistler? Well, I believe he's going to face severe consequences unlike anything we've seen before. Not only do I believe he'll remain removed from CEO position of Wholesome Foods, but he'll be terminated from the company as a whole. Not only that, but he will certainly hear from his father, the person who whose approval he relies on the most, despite their complex relationship. Not only do I believe his father will obviously be disappointed in him, but he may go as far as cutting him off, wishing his son the best, but recognizing he's not the man he raised anymore. And when he does inevitably return for revenge, I think we can finally get to the root of his issue. Because at this point, the man's not gonna stop. He's like a roach, you can't get rid of him. But this is the kind of show that will ask the question, why? But in the more haha funny way, and not in the Steven Universe I'm gonna cry way. And simply, I believe Chip could either have abandonment issues, or experience severe social issues in a very formative time of his life. We don't know much about his mother beyond the fact that she's not in the picture. Something that Cricket sort of had to deal with, as Nancy was introduced as a character who was frequently in and out of prison. God, I should do a Nancy video too. But, but actually, you know what? I know something better than that. Because a lot of cartoon moms need respect on their name. I also do believe it's possible that Chip could have either been bullied or felt as if he had something or someone stolen from him. For example, maybe he fell in love with a girl, but she ended up choosing someone who's more like the person Chip is today, which is why he went down this path in the first place. Maybe he thought people don't want humble and honest. People want success, fame, money, and above all else, a high status in the social ladder. I don't know, exploring Chip's origins just feels like the next logical step for me, but it's not my show, it's not my story, so I'm sure whatever direction they go in, it will be great. But as always, I want to know what you guys think. How do you feel about Chip Whistler as a villain? Do you want me to talk about any other Disney TVA villains? Disney theatrical villains? Animated villains in general? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below or tweet your thoughts at RoundtableVids. And for more of my own thoughts, you can find me at Vox on both Twitter and Instagram. And I cannot leave out my boy, Art with Coda, for making an amazing thumbnail. Seriously, what can't Coda do? How is he not working in animation yet? I don't know if he's even drawn in the Big City Green's art style before, but he nailed it perfectly, just like he always does. I just think my friends are extremely talented artists, and I want the world for them. If you guys don't know, another friend who was previously a thumbnail artist on the channel, my cat SU, has actually been working on the Owl House for the last few months. I'm super proud of him. 
And I hope all the talented artists who have ever been associated with the channel, and all my artistically inclined friends who don't work in animation yet, get the chance to work in animation! Because I know they can all bring heat to the table. The creativity in their minds feel unmatched, and their ability to translate their imagination to pencil and paper, or I guess in this case, tablet and tablet pen, is nothing short of impressive. Okay, I probably monologued a little bit too long, but yeah, you can find Coda on Instagram, Tumblr, and YouTube, all at Art with Coda. Links down below in the description. Shout out to our amazing patrons for keeping us afloat. We have some great things coming your way. And again, if you enjoyed this video, please feel free to throw it a like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. See ya!